Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com and by Hancock Whitney. Hancock Whitney is here for families, here for businesses, here for communities during this challenging time. Visit HancockWhitney.com slash COVID-19 for the latest. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Welcome to this special edition of Out to Lunch Louisiana. I'm Christian Mater in Lafayette. I'm Stephanie Regal in Baton Rouge. And I'm Peter Rashidi in New Orleans. Normally, we're the hosts of Out to Lunch in our respective cities, but during the course of the current public health crisis, we're joining forces from our respective home studios to bring you a statewide look at what's happening in the world of business and finance. It's no secret that not everybody in the state of Louisiana has warm feelings for New Orleans. In other towns and cities, you can find a certain amount of political and financial resentment about the amount of money and attention given to New Orleans. But all of that melts away when it comes to football. The name of the team is the New Orleans Saints, but it might as well be the Louisiana Saints. From Shreveport in the north to the most southern point of Barataria Bay, Saints fans are everywhere. And so along with all of our individual problems that we're grappling with as we work through this pandemic, we have one question that unites us. What's going to happen to football? Ed Lang is the Chief Financial Officer of the New Orleans Saints and the Pelicans. Ed, thanks for joining me today on Out to Lunch. Morning, Peter. Thanks for having me. Whatever else happens during football season this year, Ed, one thing is becoming increasingly apparent, and that is football stadiums are not going to be allowed to be packed to capacity. So let's start with the question that I'm sure every team in the league is trying to answer. Is there a way to have an NFL season where football becomes a sport more like uh, golf or tennis, where most of the audience is not in the stadium and revenue comes from sources other than ticket sales. It, is that model financially possible in the NFL? Uh, good question, Peter. What, and uh, I wish I had. I wish I had the answer today for that because we, you know, we would be in great shape. But you know what we're doing is we're really looking at all options, right? Because you have to be because it's, there's so many unknowns right now. And you really have to be ready for any situation, whether it's, you know, a full building, which we're, you know, we're, that's what we do every year. And so that, that's not an issue or whether it's no fans in the building. So we're really operating in trying to figure out, you know, or plan for whatever is thrown at us is, is really what we're planning for. So we're looking at all different options. We're running different models. Um, we are, you know, we are, even, you know, we have to really think differently. You know, if you have a, if you have a game without fans, then, then how do you adjust your, your sponsorship inventory so you capture more, you know, on TV versus um, being able to see signs, for example, in the building. So there are things that you can do um, um, within, the, within the confines of, of a broadcast that can enable you to, to replace some of the inventory you have um, within the building that, that fans see. So uh, yes, it has a, a, a significant financial impact, but there's ways that we're looking at trying to adjust um, how we do things so we can ca recapture some of that revenue. And Ed, is there a secret pie graph you have somewhere that when you look at <laughs> revenue of how much of it is coming from in the facility versus TV and, and things outside? Well, yeah, we, you know, we know that you know, on, on a normal season basis that, that about 60% of our revenue is, is national revenue. It's, it's the broadcast rights, it's the license fees, um, it's really the national revenues that the league as a whole generates. Um, so, you know, I feel good that most of that will be able to retain, you know, from a national scale. Um, but the local piece of it is, is where you really have to think outside the box and how do we recapture that? If, if you have 50% of fans or 25% of fans or 75%, you're obviously going to lose some ticket revenue. You're going to lose some sponsorship, potentially sponsorship revenue. But there are ways to um, recapture that net revenue through, through other means. And so speaking of the revenue and, and the lost 
and the lost revenue. You know, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but according to TickPick.com, the average price of a New England Patriots game last year was $500. A Saints game day ticket, you know, could be as high as $300. And if the teams can't make that much in the coming season because of so much lost revenue, would it really be a bad thing if Drew Brees was only able to make, say, five or ten million dollars instead of twenty-five, or if Sean Payton got two million dollars instead of nine? I mean, maybe when you're talking about rethinking things, this is a good opportunity to rationalize on the expense side of football, the same way movie studios and record companies long ago stopped paying their stars such astronomical fees and salaries to fall in line with the reality of the changing film and music business. Is anybody in the NFL having these hard conversations or is that just off the table? Well, you know, first of all, there's a, you know, we just renegotiated a new collective bargaining agreement. So that, that piece of it, um, you know, is, is in place, but there are a lot of things we can, we can look at in terms of an organization and in terms of our expenses, you know, if, if you don't have fans in the stadium, you don't have all the expenses of putting on, putting on a game, you don't have the, the halftime acts. You don't have the 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 um, video content that we put on during the game. You don't have all the ushers and ticket takers and all that stuff. So there are expenses um, that you can you can cut back on. Um, but look here here's the thing. In, in New Orleans is is good at this, right? Because we've been through Katrina, and you know the Saints had to relocate to a, to a different city, and the revenues were down. And, um, you know, their sponsorships were down and, and they had a lot of issues they had to deal with that no other team has really had to deal with, um, un, like New Orleans has had to deal with um, in the past. And so we kind of know how to handle this. And, you know, back, back during Hurricane Katrina, we still had to pay the players their normal salaries. Um, those are contractual amounts that you have to pay. And the team survived and it got through it in the NFL. And I, I believe, you know, all of sports will ultimately survive. It'll be, it'll be tough going for, you know, the next year or so. And, but we'll get through it. We'll make the, we'll make the changes that we need to make. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll accomplish what we need to accomplish to keep, to keep things going. Yeah, this is, this is Christian. So I, the, the question that burns in my mind uh, and I could be way off base on how this math is even calculated, right? Is the Saints salary cap situation, right? Mickey Loomis famously seems to be able to sort of wield some sort of voodoo on our ability to stay under the cap, right? And that salary cap, as far as I know, it usually goes up every year based on how the league does expense, or sorry, revenue wise. So, I mean, could something like this, the situation where you guys do have a decline in any sort of revenue, I mean, is, is this the moment where, uh, the, the the voodoo economics and Mickey Loomis actually catches up with him, and we can't afford the players going forward. No, I don't. I don't think that's the case at all. Because I think, um, you know, first of all, the salary cap is based on the league's total revenue, not not each individual team. It's it's calculated based on the te teams to the league's total revenue. And if the league's total revenue were to go down, you know, this year, then that would affect the salary cap in the following year. So um, collectively, the league is, is gonna be able to, to manage through this uh, because there will be adjustments to the salary cap up or down based on what the league does collectively. So we would be part of that, right? I mean, so potentially we could see the first time in a long time where the salary cap wouldn't go up. I guess it's my question. I mean, I understand that it may not that's a that's a yeah yes that's a possibility that that the salary cap wouldn't go up in the future. Ed, uh, one of the things I've been watching, of course, is what baseball is doing, and because of the schedule the way it is, they seem to be a little uh, further ahead and least discussing the issues. So are you looking at all at what's going on over there? They're talking about revenue sharing and then all kinds of other things that are kind of interesting, like not being able to high five each other and some things like that. Are you, are you kind of uh, in the background wondering how that one's going to work out? Yeah. I mean, we're exact, we're watching all of the, the kind of the, the, the kind of the good scenario for the, for the, uh, for the NFL is that we're getting to watch what all the other major league sports are doing. Right. So NASCAR started up this weekend with no fans, German soccer, which is, the Bundesliga is, is, you know, like the equivalent of the NFL in Germany. 
and they started up this weekend without without fans. And so, and then baseball is talking about starting up without fans in July. So we're going to be able to to kind of watch and learn and see what's going on um, with these. You know, we have a we have a task force uh, that's made up of uh, kind of a cross functional group of people that is looking at all these um, situations um, is really kind of um, trying to understand better how we're going to be able to operate in come September. So got, we've got, the good news is, is we kind of have some good learnings that we can get over the next couple of months. Ed, what's the drop dead date? When do you have to pull the trigger and say, okay, here's our plan for the season? Um, you know, I don't know if there's a, a set drop, de drop dead date, really, to be honest with you. And I think all the leagues are kind of operating this way because we just don't know. Like, obviously, things are getting better. Cities are opening back up. It's a process. It's not going to all happen on day one. Um, and so there's really not a date out there that we're saying, oh, we have to make a decision for this to happen or, or for that to happen. We are just tr every day. And you guys all see it <laughs> every day kind of brings something new um, and nu nuances and the science that, you know, we have, for example, on our, on our uh, readiness team, we have um, doctors from Oshner that are, that are consulting with us. Um, you know, people that are experts in infectious disease, they're on, in our meetings kind of telling us what's going on and, and how we need to operate in the future. And even, Week to week, that changes in terms of, of how we're going to operate. So um, long story short is it, it, it's very flexible in terms of how this is all going to play out. And Ed, one last question I was going to ask you is that um, when this scenario, who makes that final call? Is it the NFL, the, the president, the mayor? I mean, it would be just a nightmare if some uh, cities opened up and some didn't. Yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> It's a really good question. And I think ultimately it, it is going to be a kind of a joint um, collective decision between government officials, the commissioner, um, you know, it, because every municipality is different. And what you want to make sure of is that you have competitive. At the end of the day, the leagues want competitive balance. So if, you know, one city is is not allowing fans at all then maybe that's how we all have to operate um so you know you really have to kind of maintain the, the most important thing is a making sure that the fans and the players and the staffs are all um you know we have the safety protocols in place and everybody is is following those and then second is really making maintaining that competitive balance for all the for all the teams Ed Lang is Chief Financial Officer of the New Orleans Saints and Pelicans. Ed, thank you so much for joining us on Out to Lunch, Louisiana. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You're listening to a special edition of Out to Lunch, Louisiana with Peter Raschuti in New Orleans, Christian Mader in Lafayette, and I'm Stephanie Regal in Baton Rouge. There are a lot of unknowns in our future. One thing we do know for sure, though, is that the state of Louisiana is facing a massive financial shortfall. And whenever this has happened in the past, the first victims of cost cutting out of Baton Rouge are health care and higher ed. This time, the governor is proposing to cover the budget gap with federal funds. But as of today, that's far from a done deal. And it won't be surprising if we start to hear some of the familiar economic crisis catch cries coming from the Capitol. One of the old faithfuls is taking the axe to LSU, including proposals to close down whole departments. Now, if this happens, one department that will not be on the chopping board is the department that might be the future of education itself, online learning. Dr. Sasha Thackerberry is LSU's Vice President of Online and Continuing Education. Dr. Thackerberry, I'm not sure what your profile was with LSU before all this, but now that the pandemic is changing the entire way education is conducted, I imagine your phone is ringing off the hook. Is every department at LSU looking to put at least some of their classes online now permanently? Um, I would say yes, and... So our focus obviously is our, our students' health and making sure that we get those, uh, those students on campus in the fall. But it is a, a digital world regardless. And I think that one of the um, 
you know, outcomes of this unfortunate public health crisis is going to be some innovation in higher education. And I will say this was one of the strategic priorities of LSU, even previous to the pandemic. So the institution was better prepared than most uh, because we did have the infrastructure in place. So we have teams of learning experience designers, and we now are up to 80 programs online. So everything from micro creds, which are short form, very short form non-credit, to full graduate degrees. So we've been um, really working very hard over the past couple of years with our academic programs. We are a support division, and we are seeing, I think, an acceleration. I would call it an acceleration of the innovation that was already ongoing. And this is an opportunity to make sure that we meet those student expectations online. So we're even looking at things like the learning environment. But I would say absolutely. I, I can't speak to popularity one way or another um, of myself personally, but I, I can definitely uh, say that the uh, our faculty partners and departments were already highly invested in this initiative and it, it's just really accelerating what we were doing. And, and I know y'all were growing so fast, y'all were moving into a new building. So, I mean, you were like really on the cusp and sort of poised to take advantage of this. Kind of walk us through, how did it happen in those early weeks of this shutdown when all the classes all of a sudden went online? Was it sort of up to each professor to come up with his or her own thing? Did they go to your department and say, help us shift our course material onto a platform? Was it sort of everybody do their own thing or yeah, what? So we had what we called hyper care. So we immediately launched a whole series of just-in-time trainings for faculty. So webinars and uh, we already had prefab sort of little videos on this component or that component. It's very important to note that this was a transition really for continuity of learning. And so many of the classes that were occurring face-to-face -face were transitioned sort of to the, the closest analogous thing online, which meant a lot of um, Zoom lectures and we had some proctored online tests, things like that in a more what you would consider to be just transferring the on-campus experience to the closest analogous experience online. But those of us in the online learning field, uh, when people actually sign up for something like this on the front end, it's a very intentional design process where you're looking at, you know, what videos are the best? What group projects are the best? How do we make sure we have authentic assessments and work products? So it's a very different experience when you have time on your side, which we didn't this time, but it's also created some really interesting innovations in how you can use the synchronous classroom. So I think we're gonna see overall in the field and particularly at, at LSUs, we're gonna see that really fusion, which is that sort of high touch, high tech component kind of like mass personalization uh, of higher ed where everyone gets to see the face of their instructor a lot closer than they would have in a lecture hall, right? And then again, looking ahead of time at how do we create those micro videos? How do we create those really cool engagement opportunities online as well? So now we have a little bit more of a runway uh, to be intentional about that ahead of time. But I have to tell you, again, we have a whole team in place. Many other institutions uh, were in a different type of position. So we consider ourselves to be very fortunate. Sasha, this is Peter. I, I teach over at Tulane, so I'm not throwing stones here. Uh, <laughs> but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm just asking, you know, education has been really ripe for changes. We've been delivering it the same way for like 200 years. Uh, um, do you, do you think we should view this as an opportunity? I mean, one, the, one of the things they're talking to us about now is something called high flex, which would basically be some combination oh, yeah. of- uh, <laughs> Everything that is old is new again. That, that term was very uh, hip about 12 years ago, I think. Yeah, so, so high flex in its purest form is this sort of optional mechanism, right? Whereby um, there is uh, in-class activity, or you can participate in that same in-class activity, but online. However, my quibble with like the first generation of what you would consider high flex is that it's still very lecture based, right? So the assumption is that you can either participate in that lecture online or face to face, but it's in real time, right? So what we want to do is also go the step beyond that, which is 
um, beyond the broadcast sort of more one-way consumption-based education, right? So people are consuming content all over the place, but they're also creating their own content. We have so much more information out there, but so many more people are producing information and publishing information. A lot of our students are doing this in their jobs or just in their day-to-day -day lives. We should be in education capitalizing on that because the, the cost of um, sort of the information is keeps going down and down and down. So it's not like a textbook in and of itself has much intrinsic value anymore. You can go out and find that information almost for free anywhere. But the importance of the faculty experience is really in getting access to the expertise and access to the other students. And I think we have a huge opportunity to look at those models in a way that's much more engagement based instead of information based. And so I think that's, personally, that's where I, where I really get my geek on because you see that in professional training a lot, right? So you see in the shorter form trainings, you see small group activities or real work product. One of my, one of my big quibbles is, is uh, as students get more sophisticated in their field, you know, we have research, real research that our undergraduates can be involved in at LSU A&M, like they're actually involved in the research. That's awesome because it's not pretend research. You're actually doing the research and we need researchers, right? We need that support. So let's build in those real world projects that have value. You know, we're um, using a lot of grad students and student workers and they're getting experience in things like video production and Salesforce and all this other stuff. Well, we're getting the benefit of their huge talent and drive and creativity and all of the outside perspectives that are so important as we develop things. So I think it's going to spur longer term, I think it's going to spur a much more uh, kind of ecosystem perspective on education and kind of how do we create that um, human capital on the production and consumption side. But I also think that temporarily and again, broad strokes, we're working very hard to make sure that we're not doing this at LSU, but I think temporarily it's going to be very broadcast. -based. So you talk about trying to get people engaged, try to get people connected. We're looking at, you know, a different way of thinking about how you deliver information by making it more engaged, I guess. I mean, the thing that it kind of brings to mind, right, is like the, the college experience, to your point, is about access to these experts and comes right, with the ability right. to sort of like, talk to them right after class and have a walk, which seems really challenging in mm -hmm. an online environment. And so I am kind of wondering, I mean, to, to what extent did, did, does this kind of like pivot us all the way, you know, away from what you can actually get out of the college experience? You know oh, I mean? that is so interesting. We've heard that before too. And there's a lot of speculation at the national level that what does this mean for the cost of higher ed, right? Like, like somehow that online engagement is inherently less valuable and less meaningful and less um, produces inferior outcomes. So there's 20 years of research behind this now that online results in the same as, or in some cases slightly better actual learning outcomes for students. But of both of those, either exclusively in class or exclusively online, actually the best outcomes come from a blending of those two. Well, it's interesting because previously we've always studied, studied blended as sitting your butt in the classroom versus being online. Whereas now we're doing a version of this, right? It's synchronous and asynchronous. The same time, even if you're not in the same place, versus doing things on your own time, right? I think that's kind of the future of the blended experience. But we have to remember that the college experience is different for different populations. So historically in online education, your student is older, your student is already working, 50% of our online students have kids, you know, many of them are career changers, and we actually have a career change scholarship right now for folks who've been displaced for our micro creds, which is a great way to get like upskills right away. But what we're seeing is the discussion of what this college experience is, is focusing on the population of first time, full time students, right? So we're really focusing this conversation on 18 to 22 year olds. And again, I'm speaking globally, like at the national level, we're talking about that experience. And I think 
you're absolutely right. We haven't thought about that experience in a designed way, right? So we thought about that experience in a physical design sense. Like, what does it mean to be involved in student organizations or to write for the student paper or to, you know, what are your study groups? Well, there's even research around online study groups, right? So we can create analogous experiences knowing that those experiences have to go beyond analogous. They have to have some of the best things that technology can offer in terms of social engagement. Like when, when all of this started 20 years ago, there wasn't a Facebook, right? I mean, we were on the verge of MySpace. Do you guys remember MySpace? Um, and then like there wasn't an Instagram. We didn't communicate as much in pictures and in video. And we didn't, again, co-produce content, amplify content, curate content. The technology now is so advanced that like one, one in five weddings, you know, one in five marriages starts with people meeting each other online. So online can be a very rich, engaging format, just not when it's a series of links to websites, right? So that's where we have to go in. We have to leverage the consumer grade technology that's out there. Really think about where are the students now? So if our students are on Facebook, let's make sure, I mean, I don't wanna be up in my students' Facebook pages, honestly, but let's make sure that they have mechanisms for doing their groups online and make ways for them to connect with each other. And all, folks are already doing this. I think it's a question of us making sure that people know where it is how is it intentional in the experience rather than accidental? And I think those social connections are more important than ever. But our 18 to 22 year old students need additional support. Their parents know that, the school knows that. A lot of this is how do you become a self-directed individual? How do you organize your world? You know, and, and sitting in your parents' basement is not gonna do that for you. We have to be very intentional about how we help these young minds mature and grow. It is so exciting to think about how much change is ahead and y'all are doing such a great job. Dr. Sackaberry, thank you so much for joining us on Out to Lunch, Louisiana. Thank you so much for having us. You're listening to a special edition of Out to Lunch, Louisiana with Stephanie Regal in Baton Rouge, Peter Raschuti in New Orleans, and I'm Christian Mater in Lafayette. Over the past couple of months, if you have an office job, well, we might have to come up with a different title for your occupation. We've traditionally called it office work because it was done at an office. But as we've all discovered, you can do office work at home. Working from home has turned out to have all kinds of advantages. Office workers can avoid commuting and enjoy a more integrated work-life balance, and employers can cut down on the expense of running an office. But what do these changes mean for people whose lives and livelihoods revolve around the office? And there are plenty of them. Realtors, food courts, commercial cleaners, and almost every retail outlet in downtowns and CBDs everywhere that revolve around the foot traffic that clusters of offices generate. Possibly nobody is more affected by these changes or more of an expert at being able to predict the future of office work than Ashley Thibodeau Herbert. Ashley is CEO of a New Orleans-based company called Bart's Office. Bart's Office is a full-service office moving company, but it does more than just move office furniture. Bart's does everything from making sure you buy the furniture you need to setting up your internet network. One of the clients they worked with in 2019, for example, was setting up the new New Orleans International Airport. So Ashley, is this whole work from home period going to be something we look back on as just a temporary phase? Or are we looking at a more permanent change to our relationship with the workplace? Well, I would have to say that you also forgot to mention working in pajamas every day as an added benefit to the work from home model. Um, as far as the long term impacts or effects of this, you know, I, I think even to um, to attribute what you know some of the the previous guests just said about the the cycle of you know how things come into play and how things are hot now and then in you know ten years they're they're not hot but then they come back you know so I think um, we had you know, the model of, you know, big, big floor, floor plans and, you know, big spaces, high walls, you know, and that was like on the outs, right? That was on the way out. People were, you know, making smaller workspaces, joined, shared, everybody was on top of each other. Co-working was big, you know, that was the hot new, you know, ticket item was, um, you know, the co-working and the social. And now based on <laughs> the pandemic, which, 
obviously is, you know, unforeseen in the market, you know, so no one predicted, you know, or projected that this, you know, could be, um, could be happening, you know, has turned that model on its head. So I have um, quite a few large clients that were either all the way through that process of like, you know, redesigning their office space and, you know, creating these, you know, hub networking and co-working places and, um, you know, really making a socialized work environment. And now they've either, you know, put those, you know, efforts and, you know, stopped them in their tracks. And so they're not, they're no longer going with that model and they have to kind of go back to the drawing board and rethink what they're going to do and what their next steps are going to be and how they salvage what they've done, you know, from a financial perspective, um, you know, or how they modify what they've done. So, um, you know, and then on the other side of that too, there's also, you know, an element of them that are saying this work from home model is going to become permanent you know, and they are going to kind of flex their workers. So, you know, people are going to hotel and work one week in the, in the office, one week from home. So that way, you know, just by that model specifically, that's going to decrease the, you know, the commercial footprint of businesses drastically. Um, you know, a lot of them are really like bought on or logged on to this work from home model. Um, you know, they're talking about bringing only like a fraction of their employees back, the ones that you know, would actually, you know, thrive in a, in a in-house, like, you know, in an office, you know, environment, but they're really looking hard at the numbers to determine, you know, who can sustain, the, you know, the work from home model and does this make sense? And financially, is this the direction we need to head in? So I think that's a lot of, that's a question that a lot of businesses are faced with right now. Um, and it's, it's something that's going to be, you know, it's basically going to come down to the numbers because I think everybody's going to have to take a hard look after this at their financials. You know, I know my business in particular has been impacted. I mean, for, I think we'll have a slight, you know, uptick in, you know, in our work because of, because of this. So people are going to have to get out of their offices. They're going to have to decommission. They're going to have to, you know, decrease their footprint and all of that's going to take, you know, utilizing my services. Now it's how do I, you know, how do I become, you know, the next, you know, relevant thing in this world, you know, to, to keep my business model, you know, flourishing and, and kind of moving forward. So that's an interesting point. I mean, like thinking about what you guys do specifically, and I'm sitting here at my desk that I have in my home that I bought years ago, never imagining that it would be the thing that I work on all the time. So it seems to me that there could be a mistake in thinking, not, not you making the mistake, but generally to sort of say like, well, this is going to be, tragic for the, the way we think about office furniture because the reality is a lot of people might be thinking this is the time I need to outfit my home with new office furniture. I mean, are you guys kind of getting an idea of, of what the, the, the home-based office worker will have to consume in order to, to stay sane while working from home? Yes. So right before this actually really started, you know, ramping up, um, I was in talks specifically with a furniture, furniture manufacturer uh, regarding the work from home model. Um, and how they were kind of pivoting in a sense to to capitalize on those efforts. So, you know, lighter, very desks, height adjustable, you know, things that are small and can fit in smaller spaces, you know, to outfit people's home offices. So those conversations, you know, we are looking very, you know, very closely at that model, seeing how we can, you know, how we can pivot as a business and how we can, you know, take advantage of those efforts. Um, and then also kind of, help people out, you know, being more ergonomic at home, you know, kind of designing a workspace that, you know, is makes them creative or helps them kind of flourish in their work from home environment. Because I know for me, particularly, I'm sitting here saying this, I'm at a, a kitchen table. <laughs> you know? So my work from home <laughs> is not, you know, is not even what I would envision, you know, giving to a client, you know, at this point. So, um, you know, we do partner with, we don't actually sell furniture, but we do partner with um, a lot of manufacturers, a lot of dealers, and, um, you know, we kind of help them, you know, cross promote their efforts to our clients as well, you know, and just kind of help them in these efforts. We've also got, you know, for the people that are going to stay, you know, with that kind of corporate office environment, um, we are ramping up efforts, you know, we're doing um, social media campaigns to prevent or to provide, you know, kind of like plexiglass dividers. We've got, you know, high touch point um, you know, screen covers that basically keep germs off of a surface, you know, high to, so if you've got an ATM or if you have, 
um, door handles or you have um, elevator buttons or, you know, any points that people are just touching, you know, day in, day out, we can film those. And basically, you know, that surface film that we put on it will prevent, you know, germs from reinfecting that surface for, uh, I think it's up to five years, but don't quote me on that. It's a, ve it's a very extended period of time. Um, so we're offering stuff like that to our, our commercial clients to either outfit what they've done, you know, and, and kind of how they remodify their spaces to, you know, kind of create this physically distance, um, you know, this physically distance environment for their employees to come back safely. Um, so we are ramping up in, in those efforts as well as kind of looking at the work from home model too, um, to just kind of capitalize on, you know, every area as, as much as we can and support businesses. Because right now I think we can all, you know, feel the pain of running in a bunch of different directions, thinking you've got a clear path. And then five minutes later, you're like, okay, well, that's completely changed. That's, you know, gone. <laughs> we need to go back to the drawing board and kind of rethink what our efforts are going to be. So those are just a couple of things. We're also offering um, sanitizing stations. So, you know, for the businesses that have multiple floors in the building, we have, you know, the touch-free um, hand sanitizer dispensers that we can provide for elevator lobbies, for building lobbies. Um, you know, that way it's giving just another layer of people to kind of feel, you know, that security and that protection of kind of coming out into the world again and, and being reintroduced to society. And I know that sounds kind of, you know, like weird, but it's it's kind of unnerving now to like really kind of go around people. And every time I, you know, I'm interacting with people, I'm okay while it's happening. But when I come back to my house, I'm like, what did I just expose myself to? Or like, how, you know, am I at risk here? You know, so, and I think a lot of people are going to have that same psychological impact. So actually, I mean, I think it's interesting because <clears throat> for instance, my office reopened this week and I didn't go, I'm still working from home because I can. And the interesting thing is to me, the value that you get from being in an office is being able to pop your head around the cubicle or buzz into somebody's office or huddle in a small group and just toss those ideas around real quick. You know, that's where you get the, the value. It's not having a desk you know, in a cold, sterile office building where you're really not comfortable and you have to waste a half an hour getting there and, and an hour getting dressed. So, I mean, the protocols prevent you from, it's a stay in your own workspace. Don't huddle in the kitchen. Don't huddle in somebody's, in somebody's face. Don't hold meetings. We're still meeting by Zoom. So like, what's the purpose in going to an office? Are you hearing that from people? I mean, how do you, how do you, right? Why, why bother? So I think the initial, the initial response is yes, that people are like, you know, don't go to the office, stay physically distanced, you know, from each other. Um, but I think in general, the farther out that we get from this episode and from this pandemic and from, you know, and getting back to like a normal life, I feel like those fears will subside, you know, to, to an extent that will allow for people to feel comfortable, you know, having those social, I mean, they have to be like, you know, it, it's at some point where we're going to, you know, turn around and say like, okay, well, are we all just supposed to like, stay at home and and never have social interaction again i mean that's that's just not possible you know for for our livelihoods for our health and our well-being you know we're very social creatures and i just feel like you know it's going to take time but i feel like again as i mentioned earlier with the cycle of things we're going to cycle back into hey this is where we need to be this is very a collaborative environment i agree you know with the you know sometimes you just need to get into a, a room with your team and, and hash it out you know and it's not always like I actually had a, a partial, a partial I, in real life meeting today with a partial online Zoom meeting. And I kept like, like, I didn't know where to focus my vision, you know, like where I, who I should look at directly because I'm looking at 10 people on a screen. And then I'm also looking at, you know, five people spread out in a room, you know. So um, it was interesting, but I feel like, you know, at, at, at a certain point when we get a little bit further past this, there will, you know, those things will be brought back online and, and, you know, it's going to change the, the footprint of the commercial, you know, office space for a very long time. And, and, and I feel like it's going to be drastic just from, just from the, the companies that I'm talking to, you know? Um, so, but, you know, we will see, and hopefully it, hopefully it doesn't stay that way too long because I do, I'm a very social person. And I like having like in-person meetings. I like, you know, getting together with a team. So I think that's important as well. You know, uh, this is Peter. I was going to ask you is, you know, initially going into this, this interview, I was thinking, well, we're going to have all this excess office space. But if you're right on the hoteling 
uh, kind of concept, the idea that you've got an office at home and an office in the office, uh, that's not really going to be the case. In fact, it, uh, the outcome would really be just a lot more office furniture. And so I mean, is that where you're seeing it going? I'm, I'm hoping, I think that what a lot of people are going to do is they're going to expand their footprint, you know, for each individual workspace. You know, a lot of people were sharing offices. A lot of people were co-working, um, you know, even with the hoteling model, there is, you know, an element of, you know, the sanitation that has to happen in between, you know, one person working there to the next. Um, you know, so by that measure, there would still be, you know, a high volume of work, you know, and, and there was always a residual, like people are still going to move, people are still going to like grow, you know, people are going to, you know, decompress, you know, kind of like decommission. So, you know, those efforts are still going to be real and those are still going to, you know, have to happen no matter what. Now, am I going to come to somebody's house and move them? Probably not, <laughs> but, you know, but there will still be an element of that commercial, you know, office space that is still, you know, required for a lot of businesses to do business. I mean, prior to now, I never dreamed that we could be work remote, you know, so I, I know that I, something that I thought was impossible was forced and has happened, you know, but I do definitely see the value in returning to that, you know, that office environment you know, and then maintaining the safety of my employees, of course. So just kind of keeping everything, you know, we've started to do, you know, like checks and stuff for people when they come into the office, you know, to kind of check temperature and, you know, so we're taking precautions, you know, but I definitely think, and I think, I think my employees are ready to get back to the office <laughs> as much as they love the work from home model. Initially, I think, I think they're ready to come back, you know. Undoubtedly, a lot of people are ready to get back to the office. Uh, Ashley Thibodeau Herbert is CEO of Bart's Office. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us on Out to Lunch, Louisiana. Thank you for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed this. And thank you for joining us for this special edition of Out to Lunch, Louisiana. We edited these conversations to fit into the time slot here on your NPR station. You can hear longer versions of these conversations wherever you normally get your Out to Lunch podcast. If you're not an Out to Lunch podcast subscriber, search for Out to Lunch, Out to Lunch Baton Rouge, or Out to Lunch Acadiana on your podcast app. At some point, we hope to go back to hosting Out to Lunch around the lunch table. But right now, though, our Lafayette Out to Lunch restaurant, the French Press, is doing curbside takeout. And you can pick up their regular menu items or family dinner. And you can get delivery through Waiter or Grubhub. In New Orleans, Commander's Palace is closed, but you can have a range of ready-to-cook items shipped from Commander's Kitchen to yours anywhere nationwide. Information is at goldbelly.com. In Baton Rouge, Mansur's on the Boulevard is open. You can eat at the restaurant where they have 25% occupancy and outdoor dining or get pickup. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical director is Eric Merle. Photos from this show on our website and on social media are taken by Jill LaFleur. I'm Stephanie Regal in Baton Rouge. I'm Christian Nader in Lafayette. And I'm Peter Rusciutti in New Orleans. Out to Lunch Louisiana is a production of INO Broadcasting. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back here next week for more Out to Lunch Louisiana. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base joneswalker.com and by Hancock Whitney. Hancock Whitney is here for families, here for businesses, here for communities during this challenging time. Visit hancockwhitney.com slash COVID-19 for the latest. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Mitchell Foreman wrote and performs all the music on Out to Lunch. You can hear Mitchell's music anywhere great jazz is sold or streamed and at mitchellforeman.com.